welcome to Owners of the Upstate. I am Mari. And I am Matthew. And apologizing, we are actually recording this outside in a parking lot because it's quieter. Yeah, and and they, the Sonata is pretty well insulated. We don't hear yeah, too much. we are actually right next to 91. You can probably hear a truck go by right now. But no, uh, it is quieter than our apartment. So apologies, but we had to get it this out. Mm -hmm. This week, let, let, let's. I got to tell you how we discovered this author. He is buried in Fulton, New York. Uh -huh. And how we discovered him is we went and when you're driving down uh, New York 3 mm -hmm. and going through Fulton, you can see these beautiful holding chambers. And we stopped one day to see about these chambers. Mm -hmm. And some of them were family crypts and some of them were holding chambers. So we finished doing our exploration of those, and we're driving slowly through the cemetery to leave and admiring some of the older monuments and that. And we come upon a gravestone, a, a marker, that's got a robot carved on the back of it. Yeah, a robot, yes. a copy of the Earth yes, with some kind of uh, spherical satellite mm -hmm. in orbit around it. Well, of course we got to stop. <laughs> it looks weird as heck. So while we're there try taking pictures of this amazing it is. Yeah, gravestone, yeah, that amazing and again, gravestone. I apologize for the trucks behind us, we discover it's an author, Neil R. Jones. Mm -hmm. Probably never heard of him. But you've heard of his concepts that he came up for in science fiction. In fact, if it wasn't for some of his writings, there would be... Data would not exist in a roundabout Data from Star Trek. Mm -hmm. In a roundabout way. Uh, yeah, sorry. Cliff Steele from Doom Patrol, Robot <laughs> Man, would exactly. not exist. Probably not. Yeah. From him. Uh -huh. uh, there's a lot of other concepts he came up with. He came up with the name. He came up with one of the names. I forgot what it was. Uh, well, he came up with ideas. Yes. Uh, like, a, like you say, transporting... Uh, Transplanting brains into machines, that yes. sort of thing. Basically, he his yeah. writings were the first in fiction that to use the idea of cyborgs, uh -huh. robotic characters, and also the modern idea of cryogenics as well. Have we mentioned his name yet? Neil yes, Ar yes, we did. Okay. Neil Jones. Yeah. Uh -huh. So he is famous for these Professor Jameson stories. And mm -hmm. just to give you a nutshell who Professor Jameson is, Professor Jameson wanted to achieve immortality. So he literally froze himself, but he froze himself by going into orbit. Was mm -hmm. that it? I can't quite Yes, yeah. he had a cryogenic, uh, was, I guess a capsule. Yes. A cryogenic capsule uh, with himself and it shot out into space. And that's where uh, creatures that's where the Zorums found him. The Zorums, yes. Which were creatures who basically transplanted their own brains into machines. Protoborgs. So, yeah, yeah, protoborgs. Proto Without yeah. the hive collective mind, mm -hmm. basically. So, Cybermen. Cybermen. Basically, yeah. Without the like militaristic that. fascism, yeah. <laughs> right. So. right. Yeah, and he was publishing these stories uh, in the early 1930s. Yes. Mainly in Amazing Stories. Mm -hmm. He also published him in other um, pulp fiction like that. And what I meant by Data being mm -hmm. kind of inspired by him, uh, Isaac Asimov was inspired by his stories. And if anyone right. who's a Star Trek fan knows, the positronic brain actually came from an Isaac Asimov idea. So right. That's exactly. why I would say Data is um, in indirectly... You know, mm -hmm. I don't know what you'd call it, a an idea born out of an idea like this guy came up with. And then I mainly thought of, you know, Cliff right. Steele from Doom Patrol as well. Steel because Doom Patrol. Right. Professor Jameson, the character, once he was cryogenically frozen and shot into the satellite, he mm -hmm. was found by those, those, those creatures. But that was millions, millions of years into the future. I think 40 million years. 40 million, I believe. Yeah. In, in the future. Yes, 40 million years mm -hmm. he was found. Um, he Earth was dead at this point. Yeah. They, Human beings were gone. Th so they they took this guy's brain and put him in one of their machine mm -hmm. bodies. 
And there you go. There's Cliff from Doom Patrol. Exactly. <laughs> you know, Mr. Robot Man. Because that's exactly what his character is. His brain is the only part of him that's left. Yes. And it's in a robot body. Mm -hmm. I don't think Professor Jameson swore as much as Robot Man, but... <laughs> Oh, my. Yes. Oh, prolific swear. Yes. Cliff Steele. So, you see, yeah, I, in case you don't believe me about the Isaac Asimov, there's a quote here. It says, Isaac Asimov noted that Zorby's organic brains were a minor detail. Jones treated them as mechanical men, making them objective without being unfeeling, but benevolent without being busybodies. And he cites Jones Zormies as the spiritual ancestors of his Positronic robot series and credits them as the origin of his attraction to the idea of benevolent, benevolent robots. robots. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there you go. Yeah. yeah. And also there was a, uh, if you want to go for an anime inspiration that Jones had, uh, oh, I am going to mispronounce this name uh -huh. and I apologize for any, any anime fans. Masamune Shiro? Thank you. <laughs> I was going to. Yes. I was going to butcher. Uh, he cyber. He did the Ghost in the Shell saga, and mm -hmm. he also includes this no fill brains in a box design, and names them, naming them Jameson type cyborgs. So there is a direct homage there, which is awesome. Yeah, that's great. Here's this author buried in Fulton. I was really big in science fiction when I was younger, and I've never read one of his stories. And I bet there's a lot of people listening who are going, who? Well, he was big in the pulp times. Mm -hmm. Definitely big in the pulp times. He was, <clears throat> oh, let me find a list of his. Well, Jane, <clears throat> well, Jones said himself that he was inspired uh, to invent the Zorms mm -hmm. when he read H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds. Right. And the, the Martians with their weak bodies that were augmented by war machines, that sort mm -hmm. of thing. Yes. And he also drew inspiration from Sowell Peasley Wright's stories mm -hmm. of uh, Commander Hanson and the Space Patrol. Was <laughs> <laughs> well, that a serial name or what, man? <laughs> All running in astounding stories. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I mm -hmm. don't think I have a list of his... I'm, I'm, we will have a list of his stories in the, in our notes on our blog mm -hmm. list, but yeah, many of them, uh, include, uh, the Jameson, uh, mm -hmm. satellite. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. Times mausoleum. Right. Which was the fifth story mm -hmm. and was featured in amazing stories, 1933 issue, yep. December. So like I said, a lot of them were amazing stories. There was another one, uh, magazine he published, Wonder Stories, as uh -huh. well, Wonder Stories Quarterly. We have this prolific author in Fulton uh -huh. who never really leaves Fulton. No, well, he, he did he did for one part of his life. He, he was in England for a while. So let's discuss this guy. Okay. So like I said, he was born in Fulton in 1909. Mm -hmm. that, that's my notes say. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. He... 29th May, 1909. 1909. And really had a pretty standard life to the point. Uh, mm -hmm. He did writing in school. And, you know, they kind of knew about it when he was in high school. Because mm -hmm. uh, it says here in the Palladium Times on June 22nd, 1927, that Jones had decided to become a writer, specifically science fiction, was summed up in the caption for his graduation picture in the 1928 no notebook. Note the mention Dust in the Road, a one-act play that Jones appeared during the Christmas of 1927. So I find that interesting. He was already writing when he was in high school. He'd write, mm -hmm. like, uh, essays, and he was often mentioned in the newspaper about being one of the student writers. And usually, right after graduation, people go right into business or off to college, and he didn't seem to do this. Now, he was, he was very... He didn't talk much about uh, his 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 life, but he did mention he got into trading stamps. Mm -hmm. So for probably about a year and a half, he was writing and doing stamp collecting, stamp trading. Mm -hmm. But then he started, you know, doing some more writing. But he was already getting paid for some of his writing. But it, um, I think there was one short science fiction in there. He did that. Mm -hmm. He mainly sent his uh, writings to the Fayetteville Bulletin. The Bulletin normally did not publish fiction. Now, at this time, 
you would run into, uh, I've stumbled upon this a lot in my research, they will actually have a section where they be have a serialized story mm -hmm. in a lot of these newspapers. Now, the Fayetteville really didn't do that. Uh, they wanted mainly poetry, but yet he was able to get three stories published in them. Right. In August 22nd, 1929, a Japanese romance. Mm -hmm. January 2nd, 1930, Bandits of the Sky. And January 23rd, 1930, Pirate's Treasure. No one knows how he got involved with that, but he did get his his writing in there. And Fayetteville really isn't that close to Fulton. I mean, you're talking 1920s. Now it's like, what, 40 minutes by road? But it's yeah. not much longer then. Oh, yeah. Um, so whether he was paid or not, we don't know <laughs> at this point, but he was getting them published. So he says here, my first large scale effort was the electric, electrical man in, 1930, in the 1930 issues of scientific detective monthly. I still have a sequel to it in the Limehouse dope mystery, which written just before the magazine was discontinued. The death heads meteor in the January, 1930 issue of Iron wonder stories was my first appearance in the big time although it was written some months after the Electri Electrical Man. That was in Meet the Author's Amazing Stories, April 1941. I mm -hmm. elbowed my way into science fiction field by selling my first six stories. After that, it was tougher, and I modified my earlier illusions of it being so easy. That was, in, that was a quote from Meet the Author's two complete science fiction adventure novels, summer of 1951. So he, he was, mm -hmm. I got to say, a little bit, he was a little bit successful off the bat. Uh, mm -hmm. kind of reminds me of Ray Bradbury. Ray Bradbury started writing and they you know, slowly started picking up. Cherry Pratchett was another one. He started writing for newspapers and then he slowly got his stories published. But Cherry Pratchett's fan, you know, he's fantasy. <laughs> so, <laughs> right, exactly. But, you know, I think Bradbury's a better... Um, yeah, yeah, he has a better, better parallel yeah. to mm -hmm. present as an example mm -hmm. as to what the kind of the writer that Neil was. Now, Amazing Stories was first released in April of 1926. Mm -hmm. uh, Jones was 16 at the time. He started collecting the Amazing Stories. Mm -hmm. So he's already a fan of the magazine before he starts sending his work there. So in 1928 or 1929, he begins submitting stories to Amazing Stories. He doesn't say how many he sent, but three were accepted. Jones claimed Electrical Man was his first sale. The story and its sequel, Shadows of Night, were deemed not to be science fiction enough for... So that's where they were published into the Scientific Detective Monthly. monthly. Uh, the 1930s issue, Amazing Detective Monthly, the second title being simply a continuation of the Scientific Detective Monthly. <laughs> okay. Uh, both stories... can concerned a detective called Rand Miller and this was a character who used gadgets devices to solve crimes hmm. Mm -hmm. hmm doesn't say he dressed up like a bat but hmm you know <laughs> but there you have Inspector Gadget or Inspector Gadget yeah but it didn't say he, he was the gadgets he just used <laughs> the gadgets and he had a thing called an electrical wand which mm -hmm. nowadays we'd call a taser uh so that's kind of interesting. Really? And he even hinted that this particular detective was creating a bulletproof suit to wear. So, But he never continued with the story. Or the stories were never bought from there on. Hmm. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. Now the Jameson Satellite. That was the start of the Professor Jameson stories. And it's very different. Mm -hmm. Amazing stories felt the story like action. Jones yeah. decided he had to go through a rewrite. Yeah, citing their you know, youthful readership mm -hmm. right. you know, as the reason that, because you know, they had a younger audience and that audience was geared towards you know, science fiction and you know, action mm -hmm. stories, that sort of thing. Actually, b basically action stories with science fiction in them. Right. But in 1929, Gernsback, who owned uh, Amazing Stories, he was uh, overextending himself. He was about to declare bankruptcy. Jones wasn't getting paid. Other authors were not getting paid. Mm -hmm. It was uh, hard times right. for, for the publication. Right. 
So when his payment for the electrical mail was on quarter, uh, Neil decided to send his rise version of the Jameson satellite to the new editor of Amazing Stories. So, mm-hmm. so that he so he sends it there. It was they didn't do anything with it for a year. They liked it, but they didn't do anything for a year. And then finally, they published it in the July 1931 issue. Although the new series was popular from the beginning, there are only two mentions of it in the amazing letter columns regarding the series. He's now published. And they're popular, but it didn't seem like anybody was really promoting it. So maybe they thought it was popular if they didn't need to promote it. Right. And the local papers would just mention, hey, he's published another story, and a local boy does good you know, at that time. Yeah, that sort of thing. Yep. And so he kept uh, writing, though. Right, he kept writing, and he's still living in Fulton. Mm-hmm. He Aww. did say he worked 20 hours a week at his writing when he was in the census at one point. So, <laughs> I'm trying to find where he did, he went to England. Yes, he did, during mm-hmm. the war years. That's right. He he enlisted mm-hmm. during the war years. Oh, he didn't enlist. He no. was yeah. He was drafted. He was drafted. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh-huh. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. It was. Here's a quote here from him. Mm-hmm. It was my good fortune question <laughs> mark mm-hmm. to travel abroad as a guest of the government late in 1942. All expenses paid. I did have several months preparation for the trip during which my literary activities were suspended until I returned to the United States three years later. In short, I became a GI <laughs> from Meet the Authors to complete uh, science adventure novels, summer 1951. Yes. Uh, and that's where he met his wife. Right. In England. I'm going to back up, actually, because uh, I forgot. Uh, sorry about this. My notes are all over the place again. In 1938, <laughs> Amazing Stories was sold, mm-hmm. and they decided uh, they were going to revamp who the magazine was uh, going to be sold to, and they decided that Professor Jameson stories were just too highbrow. Really? Having read the yeah. first one, mm-hmm. I actually went out and, you know, yeah. I scrounged for it. Found it pretty easily, mm-hmm. actually, and uh, you know it's in the archives there on, on the web. And I, I read through the very first Professor Jameson story that he wrote, mm-hmm. and it's very much well, it, <laughs> very much from its time period, very much mm-hmm. in the style of the time. Right. And so I, I had to read it over, you know. A couple articles inside the story I had to read over a couple times mm-hmm. to get the gist of what he was saying. Right. Uh, because of, uh, especially the uh, the description of the Zorms. Mm-hmm. And I had to, uh, yeah, basically descriptions of things I had to read over. Right. But it was pretty clear as to what was happening to Professor Jameson, though. Yeah. Yeah, that's because, like we said, he got he shot himself into space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Thing. Well, and then going back to his, his military record, we really don't know what he did in the military record because those records were destroyed in a fire that occurred in 1973. Oh, wow. Yeah, it, the National Personnel Records Center fire in 1973 destroyed, well, not just his records, but a lot of servicemen's mm-hmm. records. And Corporal Neil R. Jones. Right. He did... The only really thing we have about his service was a letter he wrote that was actually published in the Fulton Patriot. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, it's, he wrote it while the war was going on, but no one seemed to have censored the letter. Captain Neil R. Jones, son of Mr. and Mrs. C. E. Jones. Oh, no, I'm not going to give the address because that place still exists. CPL is Corporal, babe. Oh, I'm sorry, Corporal? Yes. Okay. Yeah, Corporal... Neil R. Jones, okay, son of Mr. and Mrs. C. E. Jones, skipping the address, has written the following interesting letter from his from Germany under the date of March 30th. So I entered the military service on May 9th, 1942, and spent four days at Fort Niagara before being sent to the Field Artillery Replacement Center at Fort Bragg, South Carolina. Here I had the occasion to spend some time in one of the largest army hospitals in the world, and I was assigned to the Field Artillery of the 2nd Armored Division early in October a couple months later taking ship for French Morocco. 
I lived on the hills overlooking Casablanca for a few weeks until we moved into a great corked forest near Rabat and its more notorious twin city, Sale, and the toughest city in the west coast of Africa. Before we left, I had occasion to stand guard beneath its dark keyhole city grates, which were hooded and shrouded figures moved silently in the shadows leave you wondering if they were coming up to you to find a soft spot to fit a knife or to bag a cigarette. Oh. God, that sounds like a horror park. But anyway. Oh, goodness <laughs> sakes. After four months in the cork forest, we left for the vicinity of Rabat and its looming guardian, 11th century Tower of Hasten, to depart the French Morocco over the Atlas Mountains, with its winding mountain roads and deep cliffs reminding one of the Burma Road for natives that worked on this road too. And on to and into Algeria. Nearly a month was spent on the rocky hill here in Algeria, in Algeria, and on clear days we could see a mountain towering near the sea, near Iran. We were only a few miles from the Mediterranean ourselves, and occasionally enjoyed swimming in its clear blue water, and I enjoyed it even more later on diving and swimming from the open portals of an LST in the harbor of Onan. Well, you know what? Mm -hmm. His description, mm -hmm. first of all, and of his experience in French Morocco. That sounds a lot like Moss Eisley. Moss Eisley? Oh, I was thinking Catch-22? Moss Eisley Space Station, babe. Oh. Star Wars. Star Wars. Well, I was thinking of Catch-22, because was, was that where the man was stationed in Catch-22? No, it was Italy. He was in Italy. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyways, I was thinking near the mirror. Well, never mind. Mm -hmm. I wonder. Mm-hmm. If uh, Lucas then read uh, his maybe, stories, maybe. Well, I mean, Spielberg did the Amazing yeah. Stories, a series which was inspired by those stories, so uh -huh. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and they're they're working buddies. So, in any case, all the wreckage and aftermath <laughs> of the war smote us as we reached the vicinity of Bizetta, with its demolished city, its graveyards of swastika painted planes of all shapes and sizes, and the usual strewn and abandoned offal of tools of war. At Casablanca, we found ourselves in the midst of one and only German air raid made to that city. But here at Blitzen, we have, we felt ourselves observed, word is missing, to war and possibly because of our own imminence to it. Partly through, partly though, because so much of its significance lay close to hand, olive groves replaced the cork forests of the French Morocco and the barren hillsides of dusty Algeria, while here I visit Tunis and Carthage. Oh, and it goes on. He really, mm -hmm. he's... Well, he reboarded the LSTs and mm -hmm. went on to Sicily. Yeah. And... Uh, he saw yeah. Gibraltar, and then they finally... Then to the Sahara Desert, mm -hmm. to the south. Finally makes it to England. So everyone yeah. enjoyed himself in England. It was the closest thing to being at home and a second choice of every American soldier. Six months of civilization and social life while preparing for the big jump. Lasting friendships and many marriages remember that <laughs> <laughs> besides offering entertainment and living conditions approximating home england is rich in historical lore and legends and relics of antiquity i saw most of london had to offer and i often consider myself fortunate to be able to look upon the oldest monuments of england three thousand year old druid stones of stonehenge with their trilon proprieties center stone sacrificial stone isolated devil stone and the little known legendary information regarding these religious relics set so mathematically conform to the seasonal transits of the sun. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. All right. So, yeah, this is a very lengthy letter. I would send, have you read it all, but it is interesting how much he was talking about this is where I was, this is where I was, and it wasn't censored. But I think what's also interesting is it is very general as well. Like, oh, yeah, we mm -hmm. were here. But he doesn't give you precise dates or times, you know, so that's probably why he got past the censorship. He does make a reference to lasting friendships and many marriages. Right. Because he was wed in England himself. Right. He married, this is the announcement in the newspaper. Announcement has been received here the marriage of Miss Rita Wonderland Reese, daughter of Mr. and Mrs. H. Reese of London, England, to Corporal Neil R. Jones, son of Mr. and Mrs. C. E. Jones. The ceremony took place on June 19th in St. Mary's Episcopal Church, Eastman, London. Reverend R. Brandreth performed the ceremony, and the bride was given into marriage by her father. Miss Winifred Hart was maid of honor, and Miss Marjorie Bell, bridesmaid. 
Trevor Reese, Brothers of the Bride, was best man. In the reception followed the ceremony at the Reese home. Jones is a member of the 2nd Armored Division, the 14th Armored Field Artillery Battalion. Mm -hmm. And then when he returned to the United States, Rita came with him. Mm -hmm. So, Benny comes back to Fulton. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Now, there isn't a, a whole lot of details mm -hmm. about how he spent his time. No. Uh, he was a recipient of the 1944 GI Bill, mm -hmm. granted returning servicemen and women allowances for college, home loans, and even funds to cover periods of unemployment. Right. But it, it's unknown if he uh, took advantage of any of these. Right. And uh, he would have uh, needed to take a bit of time to mm -hmm. become uh, reacquainted with civilian life and also uh, become used to his new position as a married man. And the... And the publishing started to change, too, because mm -hmm. prior to World War II, there was a lot of hope for the future type writing. Yeah. But then after World War II, there was a lot of cynicism brought in oh, yeah. to it as well, brought into science fiction um, at that time. So they became, the stories became more concerned with the effects, both good and bad on humanity, especially what war could do to humanity. Uh, yes. Except for, you know, if you put, you, know, yeah, you can look at the movies at that time. You had a lot of monster movies, and why did, you know, why was this mo monster attacking? Oh, it was due to this thing released during the war, or, you know, you know, type of stuff. Right? Exactly. The, the dangers of radiation were a mm -hmm. common theme. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, he didn't do much publishing after that. He did do a couple stories, but not much. Uh, well, he changed mm -hmm. uh, his writing about science fiction changed. Yeah. The world changed. Right. And so I don't know mm -hmm. uh, whether or not he felt that there was a place for Professor Jamin Sue. Yeah, at that point, you know, yeah. In, in the world. Now, he did, he liked board games. He created his own board game called Interplanetary. Hmm. Not much information on there. Uh, it is mentioned in the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction and Fantasy. It says it's a disc encounters game, which has proved quite popular. Ah. If it was popular, then why don't we yeah. have a copy of it somewhere? And there, Yeah, and you can go on to like gaming encyclopedias, and they just mention the name, but there's like no pictures of the game. There's no idea how the rules are played. What was it called again? Interplanetary. Interplanetary. So right. it was in 47. That's when he got employed by the uh, state of New York. That's when he became a, a civil servant mm -hmm. working for an unemployment insurance. And so he was uh, basically the person you come to when you lost your job. So, And that office in Fulton still mm -hmm. exists today. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, the house uh, that he and Rita yeah. had in Fulton still uh, exists. That's why we're not giving you the... the, the the but, addresses, because people still live in these places. So. But it's only just a stone's throw mm -hmm. away from Mount Edna mm -hmm. Cemetery, where they're both buried. Yeah. Now, like I said, he didn't publish once, but he did. In 1948, in the issue of Fanscendent, there was an article published called The Legend of Interplanetary, which was the first time Jones had, had anything published in six years. Mm. So it just... So he took some time off from yep. publishing. He may have written stories. Right. Maybe scratched out a lot of notes on mm -hmm. ideas and things like that, but didn't actually, yeah, it took him years to get but back the, in the swing. The Legend of Interplanetary is interesting because he took all his stories he had published so far, mm -hmm. and he basically came up with a timeline to include all the stories. So he basically created the Neil Jones universe. At that yep. point, with this, oh, yeah, you know, I, I guess we, you know, that's what we call it now. It's the MCU or the D -E DCU. No, this was the Neil uh, Jones the Neil universe. Jones. Yeah. yeah. So that's kind of interesting. I don't think that's he was the neat. first to do that, but I just find that interesting. He did. So, like we said, we, we he's kind of falls by the wayside at this point. I mean, there uh -huh. were still people reading him. I mean, mm -hmm. Asimov mentioned he was, you know, an inspiration. Yeah, exactly. The aforementioned yeah. authors that yeah. we said that were influenced by his writing. And, you know, and I, about this time, you're going to think in like the 1960s, that's when a lot of people were rediscovering the Amazing Stories books mm -hmm. and that as well. So. And you got to take into account with the 
popularity of mm -hmm. things like comic books, right? Graphic novels, that sort of thing, and you know, just uh, stories mm -hmm. uh, laid down in text. You know, right. no, no, nothing else. Uh, but the reader's imagination to carry them along through the story and um, amazing stories was still there, mm -hmm. you know, when uh, when he was ready to go back to publishing again. Right. But in the 1960s, tragedy strikes. Oh, Neil. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to read the off the the article. Mm -hmm. Find woman with throat slashed. A Fulton woman was rushed to Lee Memorial Hospital at 9 a.m. Monday, suffering from a severely slashed throat. Ms. Rita G. Jones was found by a neighbor, Ms. Dorothy Canfield, who called the police. Mentor's ambulance was summoned and rushed Ms. Jones to the hospital where her condition was reported critical early this afternoon. Police are investigating to determine whether it was foul play or the wound self-inflicted. The next day, self-inflicted stab wounds are fatal to a woman. To a woman. Ms. Rita G. Jones, 38, died Monday afternoon in Lee Memorial Hospital from a self-inflicted stab wound. Mrs. Jones' wife, Neil Jones, was rushed to the hospital shortly after 9 p.m. Monday by mentor ambulance with lacerations to her neck. She died shortly after 2.30 p.m. on Monday. Detective Eugene Thompson investigated and reported the woman, a native of England, had been despondent about her health recently. Surviving beside her was her husband, her mother, Miss Minnie Reese, living, visiting in Fulton from England, two sisters, Miss Ivy Rose and Miss Violet Farnay, Farnby, sorry, and two brothers, Albert and Trevor Reese, all of England. Services and it goes into everything mm -hmm. after that. The first time you, I read that, I thought, oh my God, she was murdered. And then right. immediately the next article you read, well, self it was, was self-inflicted. So his wife committed suicide and they mentioned her illness now her mother is coming over to visit i they don't say anything they they kept the privacy of what mm. was going on but i can assume she developed some sort of illness possibly terminal yeah. mom came to visit and she decided to take her own life at that time while her mom was visiting oh my but in such that's a way that's my theory that is my theory um, i can't prove it but that is my theory um and that did affect neil he comes a recluse you met you see his name mentioned sometimes in classified ads yeah aside from you know, his work over at the employment office he yeah he, he becomes rather reclusive becomes, and then uh but in 1955 uh ace books they decided to publish, do reprints of these mm -hmm. stories. Like I said, in the 1960s, people started rediscovering these stories. That's mm -hmm. where a lot of uh, people in the 60s rediscovered him. So then that's where we see the influences later. Right. That, uh, again, From the late 50s until mm -hmm. the late 60s. Right. Uh, Ace mm -hmm. publication. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. Pretty prom prominent uh, publisher of science fiction, yeah. I guess. In 1973, Neil retires from his position as an unemployment insurance claims ex uh, examiner. Hey, state job's a good gig, so he retires. <laughs> uh, he still maintains a social life, though this comes from a newspaper. The second note came from Miss Elsa McRae, who was in one of the dance teams that won a trophy. Recent silver and gold gala, Mrs. McRae and her partner, Neil Jones of Fulton, were the tox the top fox trotters at the annual dance party. So, oh, my golly. So he took up dancing. Yeah. Well, well, you can still cut a rug, I guess. Now, he did remarry sometime in the 70s. He married Leona Marie Harbottle Trice. Leona, um, they ran a dairy farm outside of Fulton until 1975 where he passed away. So yeah. they were often mentioned in the newspapers. Um, there's no record of the date they actually married. I find that interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. He, at, you know, he's passed away in the 70s, and nobody's really reading his stuff, but then we get some more reprints happening again in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. Specifically, a German publisher starts publishing his stories. Moig? Moig, yeah. yeah. M O E W I G G. Mm -hmm. yep. Sorry, W I G. 
M O E W I G. Mm-hmm. Moig. Uh, not. It doesn't know whether. Well, they don't know whether or not. I guess you'd have to look at them yourself to see whether or not they differ. Mm-hmm. That these German reprints differ from the stories mm-hmm. laid down by Ace editions because Ace had to abridge mm-hmm. some of the stories to, uh, you know, fit into their strident page counts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was, uh, they can only do so many pages uh, per... Well, I've got two dates on his death, unit. 1975 and 1979, but he did, basically late 70s, he passed away, I'll have to check exactly which date, uh-huh. what year it was, uh, but he passed away due following long illness, is what's said in it. Well, it says here in an, ob- an obituary, mm-hmm. uh, Jones, uh, age 78, mm-hmm. uh, passed away from a, following a long illness. Right. And so, and the uh, the date of the publication, the the date of the article, mm-hmm. is from uh, February twenty sixth, nineteen eighty eight. Right. So. Now, yeah. after he passed away, he, he had a bunch of papers. They sent him to Syracuse University. You can go on the Syracuse University Library, and they'll mention the papers are there, but mm-hmm. they've been uncatalogued. So you have to make a special appointment to go see them, and you've got to trudge through them yourself. Nobody has set. So they haven't, catal- they haven't cataloged them. They haven't done a digital scan of them, but they're there. But that is pretty much it. Uh, like I said, it was really interesting to discover that there was a science fiction author, a very mm-hmm. influential science fiction author, buried in Fulton. Exactly. Um, I will, I'm going to go back and read some of his stories and see how they are. But it's, it is interesting because... I guess they still hold up. Yeah, yeah. Because people are still reading them. Yeah. And like I said, you could see the influence. Like, you know, Doom... I, I keep bringing back Doom Patrol, but when we were researching this, I was binge-watching Doom mm-hmm. Patrol. And Cliff Steele is pretty much like a Professor Jameson. But I wanted yeah. to, to say that yeah. personally, mm-hmm. I feel that... The idea of having your brain stuck in a robot is terrifying. Oh yeah. And it, but it wasn't regarded that way at the time. And st- some people probably still don't regard it as terrifying, but I do. Well, there's that. I mean, uh, imagine being Professor Jameson waking up inside of uh, this, you know, tin can mm-hmm. with, with with four legs and tentacles and, and eyes all the way around it. Yeah. Because this, this was the concept mm-hmm. that Jones had uh, for a form. Right. And it, it's also said that these Zorms went around to other planets assimilating other species. Like proto Borg. Like, yes. Or proto In yeah. the same way. So mm-hmm. you have brains of different species in the same kind of body. Yeah. And, and they're all... Physically, they're all the same, but their 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 brains are from different species. And you also meet in, in some other uh, of his stories. You meet organic zorms. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, wh- ones that haven't had their brains put into you know the mechanical bodies. <clears throat> well, you know, you, this is such a big influence. On the, I mean, I don't even think of the Doctor Steele song, "The Singularity," where he talks about he sings about digitizing your brain. Right. So right. that's all, that's a step up. That that's skipping the organic matter completely and just digitizing everything in your brain and downloading it onto a. You know, I would I would accept that better. Really? Having having my mind, uh, hmm. d- a digital mind, and instead of having a physical brain that would crave stimulus. Right. Y- your physical brain would crave stimulus, you know, like touch and smell, and you know. Be, so I'm you sure you would that, want to become a Zola. That would be far more acceptable than having yeah. my or my physical brain put into a box. <laughs> Zola from Marvel. Because guys, you wind up like Cliff. Yeah. Uh, Zola from Marvel. It was you yeah. know she, he uh-huh. downloaded his brain into an AI and destroyed I mean, destroyed it, shield. Uh, <laughs> if I were to have my cryogenically frozen brain mind, you know, uh, transferred into everything, mm-hmm. that's what I'd rather have the Zorms do. <laughs> Right, right, <laughs> and right. Rather than stick my my brain inside a box and and then be trapped. Well, we could in get there. into a full philosophical debate because I do agree with you because your brain requires stimulus and you mm-hmm. the last thing you remember is being in human body. Obviously, you're in this odd body. Mm-hmm. You would have a breakdown. 
I think. Yeah. But wow, we could go into a whole discussion on this, but let's not because <laughs> it's getting very warm in this car. <laughs> and yeah. all right, so I think that'll be it for today. So I okay. hope you enjoyed uh, a discussion about Neil. Yes. Neil Jones, and Neil I hope Jones. you uh, look up his his writings. Uh, some of the it's Dr. available James on stories. Uh, some of it's available on Product uh, Project Gutenberg. Uh huh. So yeah. Hope you enjoyed this. Oh, 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 oh brains and boxes. That's <laughs> ghastly. Yes, uh, ghastly. <laughs> Bye. Thank you for listening to Unearthly Upstate. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Patreon, and on our webpage. We are also on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Sprecher, Stitcher, Podbean, Google Podcasts, and Castbox. Please like, share, and view on your favorite platform. Unearthly Upstate is an animator liar production. The show is produced by Mari and Matt Manette, with purring provided by Honey and Lloyd. Research and writing by Mari Manette. Music is by Kevin McCloud, licensed under Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. Unless otherwise stated in the episode, the places mentioned in the broadcast are not paid or contact us for any type of promotion. Please check out our webpage for credit and sources for the episode. Thank you.